Today I'd like to read a few excerpts from Peter Smagorinsky's 2011 book, Vygotsky and Literacy Research, A Methodological Framework. And I'm going to read a few passages from the glossary. Specifically, I'm going to choose entries that I think are helpful for teaching. The glossary opens like this. When I was writing this book during the spring semester of 2011 and concurrently teaching a doctoral seminary on Vygotsky, I would send chapters to the class as I completed them. As part of their feedback, they suggested that I include a glossary of key terms that they can consult for easy reference, rather than flipping back to previous sections in order to refresh and reinforce their grasp of terminology and related concepts. Most of the terms that follow came from their suggestions for what to include in the glossary. I should note that many of these terms are open to debate, and I do not present these definitions as authoritative or definitive. Rather, I define them as I understand them and use them in this book. Acculturation. Acculturation refers to the process through which one appropriates facets of culture and the subsequent fact of this appropriation. Often one's acculturation to a particular set of practices normalizes them so that any other way of doing something seems odd, wrong, or deficient. Action according to one's acculturation may work well in one setting, yet be disastrous in another. One may be acculturated, for example, to drive on the left side of the road in the U.S., a practice that would produce chaos in the U.K. As this example shows, one's manner and type of acculturation have serious consequences with how one engages with the world and suggests the complexity of cross-cultural communication and other forms of engagement with those who have learned to view and act in the world according to particular cultural values and practices, particularly those different from one's own. Affordances Affordances refer to those aspects of a setting or of a person's appropriate ways of thinking within settings that channel action in particular ways, thus supporting particular patterns of performance. Genre knowledge, for instance, may afford the production of texts that meet the expectations of those within a chosen discourse community with whom the author hopes to communicate, such that readers are in tune with its textual codes. A person who writes a report of a laboratory experiment should know that fabricating the results is inappropriate in this context, even though knowledge of creative writing techniques would serve as an affordance among writers of fiction. Constraint. Constraint refers to those aspects of a social setting that limit what is available to accomplish. Constraints are often enabling as well as limiting by allowing people to focus on achieving particular goals without undue distraction. For example, in writing this book, I've chosen to position it as a social science argument. The decision to work within this genre limits my options by suggesting that I should not fabricate examples, as I might if I were writing a satire. The constraint is positive if limiting my choices enables me to focus on making claims that I could support with data-grounded examples that I in turn render into evidence by means of argumentative warrants, i.e. statements that explain how the data illustrate the claim and thus serve an evidentiary role. The constraint might have negative consequences, at least initially, if by working within the argumentative tradition of social science research, I felt that I had lost my authentic writing voice, a problem for many novices who are beginning to learn formal academic genres. Appropriation. Appropriation accounts for the process through which a person adopts and modifies an idea, cultural tool, worldview, or other historical, cultural, or social means of engaging with people and their social environments. This term, as opposed to other terms that have been used to account for an individual's adaption of cultural signs and tools, example, assimilation, internalization, interiorization, avoids dualism between mind and matter. Instead, it assumes that the mind is socially distributed by means of mediational tools and not encased within the skull. That is, 
because thinking is mediated by cultural tools that achieve value through historical, cultural, and social practice, thinking is a joint activity rather than a solitary, isolated act. Appropriation accounts for how people incorporate and reconstruct aspects of a setting into their thinking without suggesting a wall of separation between person and context. This term negates the implications of internalization and interiorization, which suggest a more direct out-to-in process that is out of step with the view that mind and matter are interrelated. Culture. Culture refers to human interactions that are grounded in recurring patterns among people over time. Cultures may be large, as in whole nations or religious groups, or small, as in the idiocultures that develop within particular small groups and classrooms. What matters is that cultures engage people in recurring social practices that move them toward a reasonably shared understanding of both immediate situations and the goals toward which they collectively work. Intersubjectivity. Intersubjectivity refers to the degree to which different people share a construction of the setting and understanding of the basis for how the setting is interpreted by others. The notion of intersubjectivity is particularly important in understanding cross-cultural communication in which different interpretations of the same material and ideas are at work. For example, teachers who view the classroom as an authoritarian site and students for whom active vocal participation is a norm for formal settings often construct student behavior differently. To students who believe that they are expected to participate, spontaneous expression may be considered appropriate. Yet, to an authoritarian teacher, such contributions may be viewed as disruptive. Educators disagree on the degree to which it is solely the student's obligation to understand the teacher's construction and thus achieve intersubjectivity, or whether teachers have a reciprocal obligation to understand and adjust to how students construct classroom norms and help to produce intersubjectivity on their end of the relationship. Intercontext. Intercontext is a term that accounts for the ways in which social practices in similar types of settings tend to get reproduced over time. The intercontext of a social setting sets the stage for rituals regarding turn-taking, social roles, the location of authority, and other factors that contribute to the practices that constitute the action of settings of particular types. For example, the intercontext of art classes in school tends to rely on informality, creativity, conversational relationships between students and teachers and among students, opportunities for provisional composing that may be discarded, and other aspects of an exploratory approach to production. These values may not obtain in other types of classes where the intercontext suggests that a more formal, restrained, and conformity-oriented set of practices may be extant and prime for reproduction. Historical. Historical refers to the precedents through which cultural and social values have been developed over time, particularly those involved in the establishment of guiding conventions. The historical conduct of schools, for instance, emphasizes that authority is located in teachers and texts, that students play a receptive role in the flow of knowledge, that middle class values concerning appropriate social behavior predominate, and so on. These historical precedents, in turn, set the stage for emerging action that tends to rely on and perpetuate historical processes. Historical precedents enable continuity in cultural practice, for better or worse, depending on one's perspective. Motive. Motive refers to the sense of purpose that implies a code of suitable conduct in a setting. The motive of a setting thus refers to the overall purpose of action within it, even if that motive might be disputed by some within the setting. A setting's motive may be disputed or simply elided by those whose goals 
those more local forward directed plans of individuals or subsets of people suggest a different course of action and social future. For example, the overall motive of a school might involve the attainment of status through students' achievement of high scores on standardized tests, an outcome that suggests particular means of instruction geared toward test preparation. Individuals within the setting might have contrary goals, such as the encouragement of open-ended thinking, speaking, and writing that comprise a process of developing tools to promote a reflective disposition. Yet the overall center of a setting's gravity moves it toward the overall motive, whether it is explicitly stated or implicit in how action is mediated. It is important to understand that throughout a Vygotskyan perspective, the channeling of action toward a motive or teleological end is not fatalistic, but rather sets the stage for probabilities to unfold. Prolepsis. Prolepsis refers to forms of mediation that are implicit or difficult to trace. These mediational means help to shape the social trajectories of individuals and groups toward desired outcomes. Without having the explicit appearance of formal rules or other traceable means. For example, teachers often create proleptic means of mediation for their colleagues by suggesting the appropriateness and inappropriateness of particular forms of instruction. Activity-oriented teaching might be termed, quote, just playing games in staff room exchanges, such that substituting activities for lectures would be discouraged, not by the imposition of formal rules, but by the assertion of values. Social. Social refers to immediate human interactions and how they mediate thinking. Social influences, while grounded in history and culture, are more local and personal and constitute the relational setting in which human development occurs. The social environment of a newsroom at a newspaper, for instance, would involve whatever idiosyncratic social patterns emerge from the interactions of the individuals who are present. These social patterns do have a historical dimension in that the setting is designed to promote the reporting of news, which provides a motive that makes mud wrestling inappropriate during working hours. They also have a cultural dimension in that there are established ways in which news reports are constructed that provide the template for the production of new news stories. The social environment provides whatever permutations any local setting provides on the cultural, historical, purpose of gathering in newsrooms and publishing news reports. Telos. Telos refers to the sense of optimal outcome that a culture provides for its participants without doing so deterministically. It suggests not only a direction but a means for getting there through the mediational means it provides. Of course the culture itself is not an organism but a collection of like-minded people and the people are the ones who establish and reproduce across generations a sense of where the culture is headed and how to get there. Cultures that come in conflict often do so through conflicting teleological understandings. The U.S.-Soviet Union Cold War of the second half of the 20th century, for instance, centered on different teleological understandings, with the U.S. pursuing the ends of capitalist culture and the Soviets implementing, at least initially, Marx's outline of a communist culture. Each relied on a different sense of telos and means for promoting social action toward that end. 21st century religious conflicts, as well as religion-based wars throughout history, serve as additional illustrations of how telos, while serving as an organizing feature of a culture, may bring it into conflict with others. Concepts. Concepts are units of thought that ascribe meaning to the world by providing generalizations that impose a discursive order on the world. A true concept is internally consistent such that all elements grouped within it follow the same principles. People develop concepts in what Vygotsky calls a twisting path that does not proceed in a neat linear fashion. Rather, one's route toward the development of a concept becomes detoured, rerouted, and otherwise thrown off course as new examples are considered for inclusion within the concept, and as one generates sufficiently extensive related knowledge 
to make consistent judgments. For example, when I first moved to Georgia, I believed that my yard was inhabited by Baltimore Oriole birds, a bird I had come to know growing up in Virginia, because I saw a slender orange-breasted bird on the grounds. As I learned more about Baltimore Orioles, I began to doubt whether these birds fit this category, because the birds I observed were ground and shrub oriented, while Baltimore Orioles feed and nest higher off the ground. I determined eventually that the birds in my yard were eastern, or rufous-sided towhees, based on my reading about their appearance and feeding and nesting habits. I'm not sure how to pronounce towhees. According to Vygotsky, my original regrouping represented a pseudo-concept because I had considered all slender, orange-breasted birds to be Baltimore Orioles. Had my grouping been even less consistent, I would have formed a complex, which might have been the case had I included robins in this group because they have reddish breasts, yet are more plump than slender and their breasts are more red than orange, even though, like Tauhees, they are ground-level feeders. My development of a concept of Eastern Tauhees, then, required a process of differentiation that eliminated birds from inclusion in this generalization as I learned of their discrepant traits and developed a more unified process of identifying the birds and making sense of their role in my yard ecology. The development of a consistently unified conception enabled me to better anticipate future events which I understand to be a crucial aspect of developing a strong concept. For example, looking for the birds at ground level rather than mid-air better enabled me to observe Tauhees and understand their habits. I also anticipated that I could promote Tauhee habitat by planting heavy shrubs in which they could seek shelter. Planting heavy shrubs, in contrast, would not have supported Baltimore Orioles, thus leading my anticipation of a future outcome to be thwarted had housing Baltimore Orioles been my goal. Spontaneous Concepts Spontaneous concepts refers to the sorts of concepts developed in everyday life without the benefit of formal instruction through which principles may be abstracted for application to related types of action. Spontaneous concepts are thus grounded in local situated practice rather than being accompanied by the development of rules as typically happens in academic settings where scientific or academic concepts tend to be learned. Spontaneous concepts have less potential for application to new settings because the knowledge is grounded in the conditions of initial learning. If, for example, I were to live in a desert-like arid environment, I might learn from local practice that native plants have long tap roots leaves that collect water, and other means of self-sustenance that negate the need for watering. If I were always to live in such environments, my local knowledge or spontaneous concepts would be sufficient. Yet, if I were to move to a new region where plants had not evolved to become acclimated to droughts and apply the principle of not watering, my plants might die. Spontaneous concepts are thus more limiting than scientific concepts because they do not provide principles for reapplication in new settings. I have shared approximately one third or one quarter of the concepts and terms in the glossary of this book, and I could recommend this book. Once again, it's called Vygotsky and Literacy Research, a Methodological Framework by Peter Smagorinsky. And I think this set of terminology is helpful or can really be helpful to anybody who's a practicing teacher or a future teacher or somebody who's just trying to think about how teaching goes or maybe could go. Thank you.